Welcome everybody to the next part of deep learning. Today we want to finish talking about uh, common practices and in particular we want to have a look at the evaluation. Machine learning is th the science of sloppiness really. So of course we need to evaluate the performance of the models that we've trained so far and uh, now we have set the training set, the hyperparameters, we all estimated this and now we want to evaluate the generalization performance on previously unseen data. This means the test data and it's time to open the vault. Remember, of all things, the measure is man. The humans are a low bar to exceed. So data is annotated and labeled by humans. And during training, all labels are assumed to be correct. But of course, to err is human. All input is error. Which means that in addition, we may have ambiguous data. The ideal situation that you actually want to have for your data is that it has been annotated by multiple human voters. And then you can take the mean or a majority vote. There's also a very nice uh, paper by Stefan Steidel from 2005 and it introduces an entropy-based measure that takes into account the confusions of human reference labelers. So this is very useful in situations where you have unclear labels, in particular in emotion recognition. This is a problem and also humans confuse sometimes classes like angry versus annoyed, while they are not very likely to confuse angry versus happy. So this is a very clear distinction, but of course there's a different degrees of happiness. Sometimes you're just a little bit happy and, and then it makes it really difficult to differentiate happy from neutral. And this is also hard for humans. So in prototypes, if you have actors playing, you get emotion recognition, recognition rates way over 90%. But if you have real data emotion, if you have emotions as they occur in daily life, it's much harder to predict. So this can then also be seen in the labels and in the distribution of the labels. If you have a prototype, all of the raters will agree it's clearly this particular class. If you have nuances and not so clear emotions, you will see that also our raters will have more or less uniform distribution over the labels because they also can't assess the specific sample. So mistakes by the classifier are obviously less severe if the same class is also confused by humans, and this is considered in this entropy-based measure. Now, if we look into performance measure, you want to take into account the typical classification measures, and they are typically built around the false negatives, the true negatives, the true positives, and the false positives. And from that, for binary classification problems, you can then compute true-false positive rates, so this typically then leads to numbers like the accuracy, that is the number of true positives plus true negatives over the number of positives and negatives. Then there is the precision or positive predictive value that is computed as the number of true positives over the number of true positives plus false positives. There's the so-called recall that is defined as the true positives over the true positives plus the false negatives. Specificity or true negative value is given as the true negatives over the true negatives plus the false positives and the F1 score, which is then somehow an intermediate way mixing those different measures where you have the true positive value times the true negative value divided over the sum of true positive and true negative value. I typically recommend re receiver operating characteristic curves because all of the measures that you've seen above, they are dependent on thresholds. And if you have the ROC curves, there you essentially evaluate your classifier for all different thresholds, and then this gives you an analysis how well it performs in different scenarios. Furthermore, there are performance measures in multi-class classification, so these are adapted versions of the measures above. The top K error, which is the true class label, not being in the K classes with the highest prediction score or also common uh, top 1 and top 5 error. ImageNet, for example, usually uses the top 5 error.
If you really want to understand what's going on in multi-class classification, I recommend looking at confusion matrices because confusion matrices are useful for, let's say, 10 to 15 classes. If you have a thousand classes, then confusion matrices don't make any sense anymore. Still, you can gain a lot of understanding of what's happening if you look at confusion matrices. Now, sometimes you have very few data, so in these cases uh, you may want to choose cross-validation, like a k-fold cross-validation, where you split your data into k-folds, and then you use k minus one folds as training data, and you test on fold k, and you repeat it k times. So this way you have seen in the evaluation data all of the data, but you trained on independent data because you held it out at the time of training. It's rather uncommon in deep learning because it implies very long training times and yeah, you have to repeat the entire training k times, which is really hard if you train for seven days and then you have a, a seven-fold cross-validation. You know, you can do the math, it will take really long. But it can typically be used for the hyperparameter estimation, but if you do so, you have to nest it. Don't perform cross-validation just on all of your data, select the hyperparameters, and then go ahead and work with the same data again in testing. This will give you optimistic results. Because it doesn't work. You, you should always make sure that if you select parameters, you hold out the test data where you want to test on. So there's techniques for nesting cross-validation into cross-validation, but then it will also become computationally very expensive. So that's even worse if you want to nest the cross-validation. One thing that you have to keep in mind is that the variance of the results is typically underestimated because the training runs are not independent. Also pay attention that you may introduce additional bias by incorporating the architecture selection and hyperparameter selection. So this should be done on different data and it's very difficult if you're working with cross-validation. Even without cross-validation, training is a highly stochastic process. Therefore, you may want to retrain your network multiple times with different initializations, if you pick random initializations, for example, and then report the standard deviation just to make sure how well your training actually performs. Now, you want to compare different classifiers, and now the question is, is my new method with 91.5 accuracy better than the state of the art with 90.9%? And of course, training is a stochastic process, so just comparing those two numbers will yield biased results. So the actual question that you have to ask is, is there a significant difference between the classifiers? And this means that you need to run the training for each method multiple times and then you can, for example, use a t-test to see whether the distribution of the results is significantly different. The t-test compares two normally distributed datasets with equal variance and then you can determine that the means are significantly different with respect to a significance level alpha, which is the level of randomness and quite frequently you find in literature like 5% or 1% significance level. So you have a significant difference if the chance of this observation being random is less than 5 or 1%. Now be careful if you train multiple models on the same data and you ask the same data a couple of times, you actually have to correct your significance computation and this is called the Bonferroni correction. So if we compare multiple classifiers, this will introduce multiple comparisons, and then you have to correct for this. If you had n tests with significance level alpha, then the total risk is n times alpha. So to reach the total significance level of alpha, the adjusted alpha prime would be alpha over n for each individual test. So the more tests you run on the same data, the more you have to divide by n. Uh, of course, this assumes independence between the tests, and it's a kind of pessimistic estimation of significance, but you want to be pessimistic in this case, just to make sure that you are not reporting something that has been 
produced by chance just because you test it often enough and your testing is a random process and there may be a very good result showing up just by chance. More accurate but incredibly time consuming would be permutation tests and believe me you probably want to go with the Bonferroni correction instead and uh, that permuting everything will take even longer than the cross-validation approach that we've seen previously. Okay, so let's summarize what we've seen before. You check your implementation before training, the gradient, the initialization. You monitor the training process continuously, the training, the validation losses, the weights, activations. You stick to established architectures before reinventing the wheel. Experiment with few data sets and keep your evaluation data safe until the evaluation. Decay the learning rate over time. Do random search, not grid search for hyperparameters perform model ensembling for better performance and then when you check your comparison of course you want to go for significance tests to make sure that you're not reporting a random observation there's no notion of evil in that in that context other than the fact that people die so next time on deep learning we actually want to look at the evolution of neural network architectures so from deep networks to even deeper networks. We want to have a look at sparse to dense connections and we'll introduce a lot of common names, things you hear all over the place, LearNet, GoogleNet, ResNet, and so on. So we will learn about many interesting state-of-the-art approaches in this next series of lecture videos. I have a couple of links to further reading. So there's stochastic gradient tricks, interesting loss functions, and practical recommendations by Bengio from 2012 and of course I have a couple of references you see that there's quite a few papers also relevant for this lecture so thank you very much for listening and see you in the next video goodbye